Our main passage, it'll be on the screen this morning, is Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Our main passage is 19 through 39, but I'm only going to read just a few verses with you this morning, and then we'll be seated. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. In Jesus' name, be seated. We don't have kids church this morning, so welcome kids. This is family Sunday. Welcome teens. Do you mind turning off down one of these? I see a lot of uh, just glare. Thank you. That's good. This morning's sermon, I mentioned to the people that were here for prayer this morning at 915. I told Sam, I said, this is my uh, main passage and this is the title. And she said, Pastor, you just did this a couple of months ago. So she pulled it up on YouTube and there it was. There's evidence, right? Well, I said, well, we're going to do it again. The reason why is because this is a warning that Paul is preaching, or the author of Hebrews at least, but we're going to get to the scriptures from Paul. But there is a warning, but there's a great shaking happening in the church. I'm talking about the big church, the body of Christ. There's a shaking happening. I talked about this the last time I did this passage of scripture. The title was A Call to Persevere, right? The author of Hebrews, no one quite is fully certain of who wrote Hebrews, um, but the author is telling us that through this two years of pandemic, there, that was the beginning of the shaking of the church, this next shaking, this next season. And I think we're rapidly approaching some dramatic seasons that are about to fall on the church. This is a prophetic message of end times, and we're going to talk about how uh, and why that is. We're entering a dangerous period, church, and I want you to really focus this morning because you're either all in or you're not in at all. There is no, I'll come to church and play the part. There is no, when things are right for me, there is no, where's that gray area so I can fill in there. God says you're either all in or you're not in at all. Choose. Because with the deception that's coming in the world today that's happening right now, if we're not all in, if we're not grounded in the Word of God, if we're not studying and being discipled and discipling others, if we're not corporately coming in prayer and petition and thanksgiving on our hearts, if we're not just living a life that Jesus wants us to live, then we're going to be deceived greatly by the things of this world. It will cause spiritual disorientation where you think up is down and down is up. Going forward is taking, you know, backward steps. We're going to be so confused and so lost that we're going to give in to what the world says. If you're not grounded, if you're not applying it, if you're not living it, if you're not reading it, if you're not studying it, the Word of God, then you're going to be greatly deceived. I'm going to go through several portions of Scripture this morning. They're going to be on your screen, but if you can't remember them, Jot down the references this morning. 1 John 2, 18 is the first one. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as have you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the lost, I'm sorry, the last hour. We're in the early stages of this. But Christians should not be deceived of what's happening in the world right now, but sadly we are. We are being deceived. There are false religions, false teachings, false prophecies right now happening. There are big 
Christian churches with big prominent denominations that are preaching the wrong message, teaching the wrong thing. And people are living to it. They're gravitating towards it. Why? Because it, it, it meshes better with their own views, their own lifestyles. I know the word of, parts of the word of God are, are extremely harsh. I mean, can, can you not agree? Part of God's word can be harsh. But this is the greatest love letter ever recorded. No one likes discipline at the time. But what does scripture say? But later on, it produces the harvestness of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So we don't like when our parents dole out punishment, when we get the pow-pows or the spankings or, or whatever you want to call them. Nobody likes that. I mean, there are some that probably just aren't phased by it, but it still doesn't mean that they don't like it. Discipline is never something we want to go through, but the shaking of the church right now is God is saying, I'm doing this because I love you. And he's shaking out everything that doesn't align with him. He's going to shake you, church, until everything is out of you except what cannot be shaken. So you feel rattled this morning? Do you feel sore? Do you feel like life is just caving in, crumbling all around you? God is trying to get your attention saying, I don't want these things in your life anymore. I love you. This is why I'm doing it. It's not going to seem awesome right now, but you'll see why eventually. And God's promises, does he ever promise an explanation? No. But see, we have to have trust. We have to have faith in the things that we hope to see. That is what our first week of prayer and fasting has been about. Faith, great faith. God stirring up in us great faith. This morning, we had about 55 minutes of powerful testimonies for the first seven days of our prayer and fast. If you're not able to take part in the first week, that's okay. We have 14 more days to go. And it's not going to stop at 21 days for many of us. We're going to keep going. Just because you haven't been able to come doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to participate still. We have resources. All of these face-up prayer cards our petitions. Some of them might be for you. Some of them are for you. Some of them have been written by you. But we're praying for these every single day. What is to come and what is happening now, I will tell you this, things are going to get harder. Look, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to feel it. You're going to not want to get back up again. But see, that's the shaking He's not doing it because he's angry, because he hates us. He's doing it because he loves us. He's preparing us for what's to come. Because if we think this is hard, persecution is next. And I'm not talking about, oh, you're a holy roller, or you're a Bible thumper, or you're a goody two-shoe. Okay, come on. Maybe when I was a kid, that hurt my feelings. I was called all those things plus, plus some more, right, for being a believer, for being a Christian. Those don't, those don't mess with me now. What we're talking about persecution is being arrested, being beaten, being tortured, being killed for our faith. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2 says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. There has undoubtedly been a falling away from faith. Look at the plummeting church attendances since COVID. Now, I get it. We have church online. I'm grateful for that. YouTube watchers, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that because you have an opportunity. Maybe you're just still looking for a church home and you're kind of just testing the waters. The waters are fine. The temperature's perfect. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're a perfect church, but the timing is perfect right now for you to find a church home. There's a falling away from the truth of God because it doesn't quite line up with what we want our lives to be like, right? 
There's nothing wrong with being ambitious and goal-driven and all of these things. There's nothing wrong with wanting good things and nice things, wanting to advance in your careers, wanting to be, you know, all these. There's nothing wrong with that. But see, God doesn't want our hearts only to be after those things. He wants our hearts to be after him. Wednesday night, we talked about generosity, tithing of, of your talents, time, and finances. See, God wants for us to be generous, right? And I mentioned, I'm, I'm reading a book by Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway Church in Dallas. It's called A Blessed Life. And he says in the book, if God can get to your wallet, he can get to your heart. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. How many of us value our finances, our money? See, it's not ours. It's his. And when we tithe, we return what is his. And after we return what is his, then we get to give in generosity. But see, he wants what our hearts, he wants our hearts to desire him. And right now, there are twisted scripture teachings. There are twisted messages There are twisted prophecies. But this should not surprise any of us. This is happening because it's prophetic. We're going to see more of it. And we're going to see more of a prominent. We're going to see people standing up with a platform that just engulfs the nation's attention. And they're going to be preaching in these twisted versions of the gospel message. Paul also wrote about increased of lawlessness. Look at the news daily. Look at the news twice daily. Look at the news 10 times daily, and you will see an increase of lawlessness. This morning, I just read another article about more police officers being shot and killed and murdered on the line of duty. There are cities that their leaders don't want police. We're seeing crime after crime happening. I know my girls probably think we're overprotective parents, but it's not them we don't trust. It's the world that we don't trust. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. This was already written thousands of years ago. But the one who now holds it Back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The Antichrist will be destroyed by the breath of Jesus. Can you picture that? All of the pain and suffering, the labor pains that we're going through right now, the beginning stages... I'm not telling that Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but he could. We sang the song lyrics just just a few minutes ago. It just slipped to me, but we're talking about when the trumpet sounds, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, firmly standing before, I probably butchered the lyrics, but you get the idea. When that trumpet sounds, It's not then you say, oh, Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Because when that trumpet sounds, every knee will bow. So God wants you all in today. He wanted you all in yesterday. He wanted you all in in 2020. He wanted you all in when you met him. He wanted you all in from birth. But see, we have that option to choose that. The mystery of lawlessness was already worked in Paul's day. And today, many who profess Christ do not even keep his commandments. We see that with Christians. Christians might be the biggest hypocrites of all, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, but let me serve two masters. We're hypocritical often, far too often. Love of many growing cold. Jesus prophecies about the end of uh, the age saying this in Matthew 24, 13. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Paul adds in 2 Timothy chapter 3, people will be lovers of themselves, selfish, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, 
ungrateful, unholy, without love, they're unforgiving, they're slanderous, they're without self-control, they're brutal, they are not lovers of the good, they're treacherous, they're rash, they're conceited, they're lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. All you have to do is look around in the world today and see that. The selfishness that's in the world today, the treachery, the ungrateful, the unholy, the unforgiving. I mean, look at all of this that Paul is writing. Love of many growing cold. Is walking an obedient life in faith easy? No. It's not always easy. But as you mature in your faith, it gets easier. It gets to where you can just sit back and smile at the enemy and say, you know what, that's the best you got. This week, we were bombarded with some major and serious prayer requests. We were bombarded with, with things that we knew would happen. We talked about it from the pulpit even. We said, be prepared. When you're going to come with a genuine approach to God to draw nearer to him, the enemy is going to come hard after you. Day one, it happened. Marriages falling apart. A young man giving his life to Jesus only to have his wife say, I'm filing for divorce. Prodigals texting, Eric, can you pray for me this week? I have this thing happening in the next couple of weeks. I texted back, just so happens I've already started. I didn't finish this text message to him, but I'm like, I'm not praying for your business meetings to go the way you want. I'm praying for your salvation right? That's more important to me right now than his business meetings. God will handle the rest. The love of others growing cold. Faith is hard. It can be hard. It can be trying. It's testing. It's stretching. But God is shaking you in this meantime. He wants you to know that what he's doing is out of love and it's to help you Rid yourselves of the things that don't belong to him. Persecution is another thing. The voice of martyrs, right? It says that in the last decade or so, half of this century, there have been more killed for their faith in other countries. Killed for their faith. There are countries where their faith they can't even meet publicly. They have to meet in underground churches. They have to hide themselves, but they still meet. Here, we don't have to hide. But here, the numbers are growing lower and lower and lower. If you take all those who have been killed for their faith the last 2,000 years, and then those killed in the last few decades, we see that more have died for their faith, faith in recent years than over the past 2,000 years but yet we take for granted to have the opportunity to come corporately and meet. It's also talked about the gospel being preached worldwide in the end times. Jesus said about this in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We're getting closer and closer to the saturation point of the gospel message being preached throughout the whole world. I'm, I'm expecting that we're going to see a report on this to some degree next week for Faith Promise when we have missionaries coming and sharing with us how big the vast majority of those being reached with the gospel message is. The Nazarene Church sends out thousands and thousands of missionaries every single year. Your faith promise pledges supports them. It doesn't just provide food, but it also provides resources, shelter, medical insurance. Because guess what? They have stuff happen to them just like it happens to us. But their job is for the kingdom of God. There's not really a health network without insurance for them. And even then, they're at the mercy of 
what they can afford with our pledges to support them. We're getting closer and closer to the point where the gospel message has almost reached every nation. He also talks about calling evil good. I'm, I'm far past being disturbed with the gender issues of the world today. I don't know about you. I don't want to stomach it anymore. I don't want to stomach the conversation. And I know that's not politically correct. But God didn't appoint me to be the pastor of a church to be politically correct. I'm not going to stand here and my God does not make mistakes in creation. We were made in his image, not with doubt and confusion. I don't mean to be so harsh, but I mean to be so harsh. But I don't want to stomach it. I don't want to, I don't want to read the articles anymore. I don't want to. If I stepped on toes, okay, come, come at me later. I mean, come at me, but you know what I mean. Let's talk. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I don't know how long ago it was, but these, these talk show hosts that have a large audience, right? They have, I mean, just millions and millions of followers. This is way before social media. They just had a lot of viewers daily. And I remember listening to one talk show who was very, very famous and still very wealthy, very prominent figure, said that when you're born this way, meaning you don't know what you are, but you're born this way. I went back to Genesis and said, we were created in God's image. God, God didn't make me a girl trapped in a man's body. He created me in his image. So I, I look like him. I reflect him. But see, what the world is saying is evil is now good. Right? Lying and stealing and cheating and, and killing and, and all of these things. It's more or less proclaimed as, well, you're just speaking your voice. You're forming together civilized groups. You're protesting this. You're protesting that. Killing innocent babies is okay. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So the word woe here is not just a groan or a moan like, Whoa. This word means a judgment. Like, woe to that person who's doing this because they're going to be judged. God is going to send his righteous judgment when Jesus comes back for the second coming, when he comes back for his bride. But see, he wants the bride to be in shape. He wants the bride to be fit. He wants the bride to be its our best. I've talked about this a few times when I've seen just one episode of that uh, uh, Bridezilla. It used to be on, uh, I don't know what channel it was, but it was on cable. I, it took one episode. That's all I needed to watch. But what they do to prep and prepare and months before their wedding day, right? How they treat people, how, how nasty. I'm just like, Bridezilla is right. All is missing is her traipsing through downtown and destroying villages and, and buildings and fire coming out of her mouth. But that's not the shape that God are sending Jesus back for us. We're already moaning and groaning right now because of the labor pains we're going through. But see, the shaking that God is putting us through is to just get rid of everything out that doesn't belong. Woe means judgment. People who do good things are now despised and ridiculed. Look, look what happened in 2020. Our medical staff, medical personnel, doctors and nurses and technicians, firemen, you know, all these people, right? They were heroes. I mean, we, we came together and rallied around them. We prayed for our medical frontline workers. We had no idea what to expect with COVID. 
Apparently, we still don't know what to expect with COVID. But one year removed, they're now enemies. They're scapegoats. They're being fired and terminated. The people who do good are chastised. They're ridiculed. But when we see people do evil, they're rejoiced. They're celebrated. They're encouraged. They're cheered on from a distance. Someone dies in your city, burn the city down, and let's celebrate it all over the media. Let's erect statues. Let's burn statues. Let's get into wars and rumors of wars. <laughs> Hello? Is it not happening right now? There is a war happening right now. That's in its month already, right? Just about, if not a little bit more. There's rumors of other nations engaging in war. So now you know why I felt like God was putting this on my heart to preach this passage of Scripture, but differently again, because this is another warning. This is another warning about the shaking he's doing in the church. Jesus said in the last days in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. How many of you have heard about the potential food shortages? Right? Any doomsday preppers in here? Coming to your house. When COVID hit, we ran out of toilet paper. I still don't know why. No one can explain that fully to me. I was working at Market Street when that happened. I'm like, seriously? I mean, I read, we, it was so crazy when we got toilet paper in. I would stock the shelves, by the way. I would stock the toilet paper on the shelves. We would get two big boxes. Normally, we got like 50 cases of toilet paper. But they were, they were parceling it up for every store. We got two boxes. And I'm not talking about the great big ones we normally get. I'm talking about ones like this that hold, hold like maybe four or five little different packs of toilet paper. I'm talking about the six rolls of toilet paper. And not Charmin. No, no. It was Signature Select, like half apply, Right? The toilet paper nobody wants was still disappearing. We put it on the shelves, and we weren't open yet. Market Street was 24 hours, but when COVID hit, they shut down so we can clean, sanitize, and restock. But then we would let the elderly come in on Tuesdays from 8 to 9 or 8 to 10 or whatever, and the toilet paper would be gone before they even got there. Employees were taking it and checking out on the way home. I'm like, I didn't know we could do that. I'm using palm branches and co pine cones, you know, <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> He's talking about famines and earthquakes in various places. Have you heard about earthquakes being in various places? There's famines already happening right now, not just the rumors and food shortages. There are famines happening right now. They've been happening. We've had earthquakes. We've had wars. We've had rumors of wars when it was in the 80s and yeah. the 90s. Yeah, that, We're in the 20, 20s now. Just 20s, I guess. I don't know. 22. The end is still to come. Don't be alarmed by this. Now, I'm not standing here telling you don't be a prepper. Don't have stuff ready and supply. Don't have storm shelters. Don't have all this stuff. I'm not telling you that. What Jesus is saying is don't be surprised because this has to happen. Yes. In order for me to come back all of this, it has to happen. But I think it's been happening since I was a kid. <laughs> it's been happening for decades, and yet the church still is in the same shape it was when it was in the 80s. Yes. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. God's been shaking us for three and four decades of my own life. And still, we're no better than what we were. Help us. 
So we have a death grip on the things we think we need in our life. We don't want to let go of it. But Jesus is saying, hey, you're playing fetch with a dog, right? Throwing the little thing and the dog brings it back and how you were trying to get it out of his mouth. Like, I'm not going to throw it with you and touch it. Let go. But they have a death grip. They have the jaws of life clamped down on that frisbee or that, that shoe toy. I remember with Wookie, I would just spin around in circles and he would not let go. He probably thought it was a game. This is not a game. Faith is not a game. We have to let go of what God is shaking out of our lives. Let go. He knows what he's doing. I promise you. Undoubtedly, there's more violence. There's more violence growing in the world today. Jesus said that one of the signs leading to his second coming would be like this. Matthew 24, 37 through 38. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. What were the days of Noah like? You're seeing it right now. Business as usual. No concern of what's happening. No care in the world. If you can live your life carefree, let me tell you something. The devil's not coming after you. Because you're not, you're, you're, you're not walking with God. I don't have a carefree life. And I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, does that mean... I think about killing someone or stealing someone or burning down something all the time. No. See, that's not the evil he's referring to here. He's just talking about a hardened heart that is selfish after my own gain. Anything that opposes God is evil. It's of the world. You don't have to be a mass murderer or a cult leader or a gang leader, or any of that. That's not the evil he's referring to. He's just talking about anything that opposes God. His heart is evil. And we live in a world where society just carefree, living life. How many people do you know in your circles that go to church, that maybe write a check here and there, and maybe send up a prayer piece, emojis. I'll send my emojis, everyday emojis. But there is no life. There's no spiritual flame that's just burning brightly with passion. The days of Noah were like business as usual. Look at verses 11 and 12 in Genesis 6. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. I wonder how he's looking on planet earth today. If in the days of Noah God saw the earth was corrupt, and was full of violence. There are more people on the earth today than there were then. For all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. But that's when God sent his flood of judgment. But he also promised what? He would never do it again. But then he loved us so much that he said it's happening again all over. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to give them my first fruit offering. He loves us so much that he's going to spare us from a flood. And he's going to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. The son of a man coming in the clouds with great glory and power. Revelation 1 7 says, Look, he's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced. Him. And, and all people on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. And, and it's because they, they know, know that judgment, judgment is coming. Or judgment, judgment is here. Every, Every eye will see it. So, so God, God is shaking, shaking what is shakeable. shakeable. God, God is shaking what is shakeable, church, because, because he, he loves us. us. 
He wants us to realize what he's doing. Not wait till it's the last minute. He wants the pain in our lives. He wants the lies. He wants all of our hurt, all of the grievance with the devil, all of the lies, anything done our way, he wants shaking out of us. Because, because Jesus, Jesus is coming, is coming back, back sooner than later. Than later. That's, That's why, why we're going through, through this. And when, and when things, things are being shaken, shaken out of us, us all, all that is left is, left is the unshakable. All, all that, that is left, left is what is in him. him. That's why we're, That's why we're going, going through this right now. He doesn't want our, a bride that isn't ready. Look at Matthew 25, verse 3 through 8. The foolish one takes or took their lamps, talking about the ten virgins here, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long time in coming, and they had all become drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom. Here's Jesus. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. See, they weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They were described in the scriptures as being foolish. Right now, if we're not ready, if we're not getting ready, if we're not allowing God to get us ready, preparing us for that, we ourselves are foolish. Don't wait until he's here and say, oh my goodness, let me get ready, Lord. He wants you ready now. He wants you all in today. Don't wait until it's too late. And don't freak out when you see people going through things in life. They're being transformed. They're being renewed, restored. Passion is being reinvigorating in their lives. Don't freak out because God is shaking them. So you have no, you have no authority on what somebody else is being shaken. You have no control over that. It's not for you to determine, well, my wife is going through this, but, but she needs to do, no, no, no. God is shaking her, not you. Let God shake you. Let, let your focus be there. Don't intervene. Don't mess up. What God is doing is intentional. Have you ever known God to not know what he's doing? I haven't. <laughs> don't, don't intervene with God when he's, been, he's, he's, he's doing something in your life. And I guarantee you, church, he's trying right now. There's 21 days of fast. The first seven days has been remarkable. Yes. It's been life changing. And it's only the first seven days. I get it. 6 a.m. is early. And some of us are getting up at 4.45 in the morning. 12 noon. I can't come to 12 noon. I get it. You're at work. You're at school. You're unable to. So again, I'm just tired when I get home. Hey, I get it. There have been a lot of 15-hour days this week. A lot of 15-hour days. But I can't wait until tomorrow and start it all over again. Some of us have in our hearts that 21 days is not enough. Carry on. Draw closer to him. Because after 21 days, you may see... I have never been this close to God, but you can always get closer. It may take 42 days. It may take 150 days. It may take how many days are there in a year? 365 days. And then we start it all over again. It may take until we're glorified in heaven. Things are being stirred up in your church, like you. Things are being stirred right now. They are being started. I've been praying for this for months, if not years. Intentionally since January. Lord, please don't, don't. Maybe this was, uh, let me just, transparency here. A little selfishly, I've been asking God, would you reveal to the church the individuals, the leaders, the staff, the board, those who don't attend regularly, those who do, are active and active member list, those who have left, 
Would you just stir up in them what it is you want them to do for this church? Instead of having me ask them to do it. Yes. And if I'm wrong, I'll take, take that. that. But so, so far, he's answering, answering it. There's no pumps and celebration. There's no ceremony. But for years, I've been asking for the church to have a men's ministry leader. I've had my eye on several people. But many of those people are doing so much already in the church. I didn't want to burn them out. So I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. I asked God beginning in January intentionally, ask not, you have not because you ask not. Right. Or, Lord, can you just send us a men's ministry leader sometime? See, that's vague, right? No, Lord, we need it now. Right. We needed it four years ago, Lord. Yes. Joseph Rickerball came up to me and said, I, I'll do that, I want to do this. So we have a men's ministry leader here at Lakeview. Can we thank God for that this morning? That's four years in the making. Bobby had, was our last men's ministry leader. I'm, I mean, that's no joke. Bobby was our men's ministry leader and our women's ministry leader. And, and, and. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an answer to prayer. Yeah. I've been needing Sunday school teachers. God's already working out. That testimony is to come. I'm looking right at that person, but they're not looking at me. <laughs> I've been asking for others, be pro prompt them, Lord, with what they want to do with our own version of a dream team. Remember, I watched this, I watched this fast in January. I've already been asking since January. Lord, can we have a dream team? Can we have a, a team that's just Re, just restore renew passion in them to want to serve in the church because we need greeters, security, ushers we need teams of it not just people of it we need teams of it I know we're not as big as the church that we watch they have like 8 praise teams I mean of course they have like 900 college students too in one service you know they're raising 14 and 17 million dollars per year I'm like He's looking for a used minivan. You're looking for a bus transfer. But God is already prompting others in the church without me saying to them, hey, what are you interested in doing? Yeah. He's telling them, I want you to do this. I want you to stir this up. I want you to get this going. Yeah. So church, be ready. Yeah, See, when we approach him with a genuine heart, he reveals to us. You might be saying, well, I've been praying to God and asking, okay, how genuine is your approach? Right. I'm gonna, we're not going to have uh, the praise team yes, so I'm going to invite them to come up. I just realized we changed our, our order this, this morning. You might be thinking, well, we didn't have prayer, Pastor. We're about to. <laughs> we're about to. <laughs> One thing that I've been praying for is for posture to be changed yes. in our time of prayer. For the first few services, I would just come and just lay face down on the stage in reverence. And now I don't always get to do that because somebody's taking my spot. That's good. Amen. But see, everybody's coming up here. Everybody's kneeling or standing, walking around and laying themselves on the floor on the stage here and in prayer. It's not my spot. It's not my spot. But God is, God is working. He wants to work in you too. He wants to do something new in you. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Broken, sorry. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. But how many of us can actually say nothing in my life is broken? No one I know is, is just not broken. They're completely well, completely fine. No cracks, no leaks, no holes, no wearing and tearing. There's no fading of this or that. They're all perfectly fine. It is broken, so it needs to be fixed. And God is saying, I want to fix you, but let go. 
Let go and let me. Let me do what I need to do. I promise you it's for your own benefit. I promise you it's for your own good. He's testing us right now and seeing what spiritual shape we're in. I'm not in the best physical shape and I, I, I want God to hold me accountable for that. The first week of fasting was getting interested and getting used to, you know, not eating and, 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 you know, sacrificing things and spending a minimum of at least three hours per day and in prayer and worship. But he's saying, I want you to do this now. See, your fasting can, and it can improve. He may say, this is the parameters of your fast for the next seven days I want you to do. I want you to change this up. See, no, nowhere does it say, well, day one through 21, this is how it's going to be. Let God determine that. Whatever God is shaking in your life right now is purposeful. It's because he wants to remove certain things that don't belong to him. We're talking about selfishness, grieving hearts, grudging hearts, anger, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, deceit. See, let nothing be hidden. When you approach him with a genuine heart, nothing can be hidden from him. You confess it all. You say, here I am, Lord, an open book. A lot of times we compartmentalize things. We say, when, when you're going to come and do work, Lord, do everything you want in any room you want except this room. This room is off limits. As if he doesn't know what's not in that room. It, it can, can be, be the junk we keep in the basement. basement. Yeah. Takes you back to the first ever missionary I heard from the district of Seminole all those years ago. The elders remember that. What a powerful message about the junk we keep in the basement. We think because it's out of you, nobody's going to see it. Nobody's going to recognize it. We tell God, God come clean the whole house, house Lord. Just, just please don't go down here. Give, Give access, access to God. God. He, he wants, wants to get whatever, whatever you're struggling with. with. He, he wants, wants to shake, shake it out of you. I thought, I thought about bringing up, up that, that, that object, object lesson, lesson for a visual aid. aid. I, I struggled, struggled all week with, with what, what could I, I do, Lord? Lord? I was Pastor Tracy, Tracy and, and, and I just, just kind of forgot about, about it, really. And this, and this morning, morning, morning it just hit me, but, but for another, another time. time. It was, it was more, more humorous than anything. Than anything. But, but I, I thought, thought about it. it. Like, like it would hurt, hurt me physically, my hips. hips. It would hurt, hurt my back, back to do that. Do that. You, know? you know? I heard that. that. <laughs> George, George said, do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> I don't have, I don't have it with you, Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> I'll, let me just describe to you. You've probably seen this on, on YouTube. It's a cute little game. You get an empty tissue box, wrap it around your waist, super glue a ping pong ball on there, and then fill it with other ping pong balls that are loose. And you just gotta shake until it all comes out. You gotta shake until it all comes out. But they don't know that one ball is glued. And you gotta get every ball. See, God is saying, let me rid all the stuff. It might be uncomfortable. It might bring you pain. It might make you sore. Everybody else may laugh at you. Everybody else may not approve of it. But I wanna get it out. He wants to get it out. <laughs> We just have a death grip. It's not pain, Lord, but it's mine. Selfishness. It's mine. I don't want to let go of this. I can't let go of this. Because I can't understand why I went through it. I can't understand what I'm dealing with this. I can't understand why my kids don't love me or my parents don't want me. I can't understand, understand rejection and abuse and all of these things, Lord. So that's why I'm going to hold on to it until I get an explanation. Let, let go and let, let God. God. Yeah. At the cross, He's going to be sung in just a minute again. And I don't want you to just 
if you're struggling with something right now, you're, you're, you're not going to understand why God, God is shaking. You don't, you don't understand, understand what, what the purpose is. is. He will reveal, reveal it to you. Trust, Trust his timing. That was, was a common message, message in our testimonies this morning. In, in the meantime, meantime trust yes. him. When you, when you have, have question, question after question after question, after question, I can't, I can't tell, tell you that he, that he gives, gives you an explanation of why you're going through what you're going through right now. But I can tell you that he gives explanations of why when he's ready for you to understand it. But in the meantime, let him shake. Let him rid of all those things. So during this song, I invite you, if you want to come down and pray with me, if it means, Pastor, you said I'm either all in or not in at all. I don't feel like I'm all in right now. If you want to make the decision of being all in, come yes. forward this morning. Pastor Stephanie and Pastor Tracy and myself, any one of us, it doesn't have to be a pastor. Maybe you want to go to a loved one in this very room and say, I just want you to know that I'm struggling with this. Hold me accountable. But as they sing this song, I invite you to stand this morning as we close. And as we do so, come. Don't play church. Jesus wants you to be in shape. He wants you to be ready. And if you want him to have access to shake what is shakeable, you say, I'm willing to release my death grip Lord to let you do whatever it is you want to do. Change your posture in prayer. If you want your family to be prayed for this morning, if you want to be anointed this morning, I would ask, not, not just, just our pastors, pastors but, but anyone leading or willing to step, step in and say, say, I want to anoint you. I will anoint you. So we all have that power. We all have the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This the same Holy Spirit, Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in all of us. You, you can lay hands. You, you can provide miracle healings. healings. You, you can anoint. Yes. Not, not just, just me. You don't, you don't have, have to have a title behind your name. Except I believe in that power. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. I thank you for this warning, Lord. I thank you for just bringing it back on my heart, Father, to present this word again. In an all complete different way, Lord. Because you are bringing a shaking to the church. You are doing things right now. So, Father, I pray that we just respond. We step out. We step up. Father, we stand up. We get out of our chair even. So Lord, we just ask right now, do what is necessary. Spirit, move. Flood. Saturate. Convict. Pierce. Whatever is necessary, Lord. If the wind has to be knocked out of us in the spiritual sense, Lord, I pray that you do so. You have had your way this entire morning, Lord, and we just ask that your glory be revealed and poured out. That the Holy Spirit just explodes over this entire place. Let us join in worship this morning and sing that the cross. Come forward if you'd like for any kind of prayer. If you want to pray on your own, if you want to pray for these requests, if you want to bring new requests, the blank cards are in the back. Don't hesitate. Come this morning. Won't you come?